It's always a great time when you sit down with people who write stories and share their story. Arrow.net, A-R-R-O-E.net. We are unplugged and totally uncut with Michael Smith and Jonathan Franklin. Wow, I can't imagine you guys waking up in, in March of 2020 or even April of 2020 on a ship and here's this pandemic that's taking place and you're stuck on it. Yeah, it's pretty unbelievable to imagine, even after writing this the whole book about it, um, just the levels of emotion, raw emotions, fear, uh, just sort of not knowing what's really going on and just sitting there victim like a victim and you can't do anything about it. In, in a situation like that, the first thing I would do is go into meditation. What did you guys do? Really just tried to uh, figure out, get inside the heads of the um, of the people aboard the ship and both the crew and the passengers. And one of the first things we did was really um, start to figure out, you know, who are the first hand testimonies who can tell us, you know, what it was really like to be stuck at sea. Yeah. <laughs> what we're talking about here for listeners is cabin fever. And literally you guys had cabin fever. You were stuck in that cabin. You couldn't you couldn't be running around, playing around on a cruise ship. <laughs> well, that's true. Um, so the, the book is about uh, this particular voyage, which is really emblematic of what we all went through on during the pandemic at the very beginning. You know, that, that was the period where you're sort of worried about, you know, getting COVID from your groceries and, you know, rubbing them with with uh, disinfectant. Yeah. And so we we try to understand what it would have been like to go through the pandemic, but being stuck in a cruise ship with no access to the outside world, because we actually were not on the cruise ship. We were, so we had to sort of recreate that um, that whole scene. But, but see, that's that's the part I love about being a writer as or a journalist is the way that I mean, you, you take other people's stories and, and, and you put realization into it, because I mean, that's one of, bit, one of my struggles that I've been with people is that, you know, there's going to come a time where people aren't going to believe that this pandemic took place, but they need writers like yourself in order to make sure that that, you know, that we've got something that we can go back to. Yeah, it was really important to us to try and capture that moment because it really was insane. You know, you'll see scenes in our book where people are scrubbing forks and scrubbing knives and looking at the vents inside these tiny little rooms, wondering, you know, did COVID come in under the door? Is it coming through yeah. the vent? Can it live for two days, two weeks? And, you know, there was so much, it wasn't even misinformation or disinformation, it was just flat out ignorance. What, what was the one thing that you personally learned from from having these conversations? I mean, what, or was it all the same tune or did people have just a different journey? Um, yeah. So as Jonathan was saying, you know, we tried to really get inside people's heads by talking to as many folks who were there as possible. And what I learned is that everyone sort of had to find their own way to deal with it. Um, and some people really almost lost their minds. Others were just incredibly heroic and just wanted to help sort of their fellow man, strangers they didn't even know. Um, and many took grave risks to do that. So it, it, in a way, it sort of restored my faith in humanity to sort of be a cliche, because a lot of people just just soldiered through it and found a way to survive and, and, and found a way to help as many people as they could in the process. How did people get their information? I mean, I mean, was it I mean, was it through the Internet or how or did the, the, the ship's captain, you know, make sure that people were up to date? One of the remarkable things about the, the saga of the cruise ship Zandam is that their captain and Smith was brilliant at being a leader and, you know, could almost be studied as a case study in how you how you manage panic and anxiety aboard a, a closed system, you know. Uh, and what the captain did is he would he would give people very regular briefings and he wouldn't hide things. You know, passengers died. You know, there was one three day period. I mean, three day one one day period where three people die. And he hmm. kept he kept people informed, which was key. And of course, the passengers had massive amounts of uh, access to Wi-Fi. So they were setting up Facebook groups. And, you know, you know, they, one of the first things they did is set up a group called, you know, uh, Zandam Prisoners. You know, one, one, I, I remember those stories vividly of cruise ships that could not dock at ports because they just didn't want to deal with it. I mean, I, I just can't imagine how people kept sane. Yeah, as, as Jonathan was saying, um, there was information uh, internally that got to people. But um, but the, the, the sort of the desperation just kept building and building as the ship went from one port to another or tried to go from one port to another and was refused. And at the same time, the whole world was shutting down. And of course, the passengers found out about that via Internet and via the captain. Um, so it really felt like, I think, to a lot of people that they were utterly alone in the world in the middle of the ocean on a ship 
um, and nobody was going to really help them. They had to basically help themselves. Now, one of the things that instantly grabs my attention, and maybe it's just my, my connection to Hollywood, but I mean, if, if I were on the ship and we were out there all by ourselves, at that point in time, I would start shaping a government on board that, that, uh, that ship. Did, did anything like that happen? Well, um, I think the captain was the president, yeah. <laughs> um, you know, by leading by example and um, and the uh, you know, the, and he and he has a chain of command. Every ship does. And I think he managed that pretty well. Uh, you're right. Like no, there wasn't a mutiny. People didn't freak out to the point where they violated that chain of command. So they, they kind of respected the way a ship should be run, which is like a country. And it is a country, actually, because it's in the middle yeah. of international waters. So when you sat down and had these conversations, did, did anyone on board just accept the fact that, you know, this this could be it? Because I know that my wife and I had those conversations that, you know, I mean, if, if one of us gets it, what what is the next step? For sure. Um, you know, my, Michael and I spoke to many passengers and many crew. And you have to remember, this is a, an average age of about 70, you know, probably lots yeah. of 75 year olds. This was quite an elderly crew. Uh, I mean, passenger uh group so it was the, the conversations about maybe we both die maybe you live maybe i live was was very frequent we have you know there's even cases of both husband and wife both ending up on respirators you know next to each other in icu units so it was you know there was nothing hypothetical about the shadow of death Wow, that you you uh, uh, basically described what happened to my family. My mother, my sister, and my brother were all on, on those respirators at the same time in a hospital. I, I can so relate with that. But but keeping calm though for for outsiders is is. Did you talk with anybody who associated? In other words, family members who were on shore. Um, yeah. Um, in fact, the the way that I this is Mike and I, I, I my day job is with uh, with Bloomberg News as a journalist. And I got into this by actually covering this actual cruise as it was unfolding. And that turned into a, uh, a, a pretty long feature for Business Week magazine, which ended up turning into the book. And, uh, you know, especially in the beginning, the way I sort of got to found passengers was through their relatives, through their loved ones at home wow. uh, who were just were sick, uh, really just just going out of their minds, trying to figure out a way to get their, their parents, their grandparents, their uh, their kids back to dry land. And they reached this, I think maybe they even reached a level of desperation greater than the people on board. One of the things that we never think about the crew. I mean, you know, it's it's like, uh, you know, we go see a rock concert. We see the band, but we don't see the roadies. I mean, but, I mean, I mean, you've got to have the crew on that ship. Exactly. And I think the, the example that you gave of roadies is perfect. I mean, they actually have a roadie crew on this ship and they're all Filipinos. And these guys are like doing spotlights in the high seas and they're changing the cello band to the magician stand in 10 minutes. I mean, this is one big stage. And, you know, there's a lot of stage hands that are below the waterline. So I think one of the things that Mike and I really wanted uh, to bring forward with this book is just the basic injustice. You know, there's not that much of a difference between a modern cruise ship uh, in some ways and like the, the social standings aboard the Titanic, you know, they don't lock the people below the waterline, but you know, it's a rough life. If you're, if you're working in the, in the, in the hold of with these big cruise ships, a laundry room, uh, uh, the kitchen staff and, and that, that the normal workload just doubled because they had to do room service for 2000 people. So think about that wow. 6,000 wow. meals a day you have to deliver. I mean, people were literally falling on the floor. The waiters, the waiters would literally collapse. They, they just couldn't mm -hmm. walk in they would collapse or they would find the waiters hiding curled up in balls, hiding like under in the, like under blankets and stuff. Cause they couldn't walk anymore. Wow. Did, at any time when you were doing your research, did anybody ever bring up the Titanic because it's such a Titanic moment? <laughs> um, yeah, there was some talk of that, I guess. <laughs> um, but getting getting back to what Jonathan just said about the crew, we really wanted to tell this story from their perspective as, as much as the passengers or more, uh, because you have to understand people that, you know, these most folks that work on ship are making, you know, maybe two grand a month, maybe a little bit more yeah, if they're yeah. lucky after years of experience. And um and they, uh, you know, they were really risking their lives to uh, keep uh, the passengers alive, you know, who, who basically look like their grandparents. And, uh, you know, it, it's it's just really a heroic story. And a lot of crew members got really, really sick. 
and there just wasn't enough medical care for everybody. And uh, so they really suffered. And by the way, once the, the ship did make it to shore, um, the crew members were stuck on the ship still. They only let passengers off and yeah. some of them were on for months uh, before yeah. they could be taken home on ships to their, you know, to their side of the world, basically. So it's I, I was going to ask you about I was going to ask you about that quarantine period, because wasn't it 14 days that they had to stay on those ships, even though they did dock? Well, what happens is um, the CDC is uh, making decisions on the fly. And one of the decisions the CDC makes around in April of 2020 is that uh, crew aboard cruise ships are just too dangerous. They're too risky. They might be infected. So they're not allowed to get off. And so even if you're an American, uh, you were in Fort Lauderdale and all the passengers walked off and or were taken off on stretchers and then they went back to sea and week after week these people are doing what they call donut patterns going around and around in the in the in the bahamas and part of our book is to you know the idea of when you read cabin fever is that you feel like you're stuck there with the crew you know going around and around um you know paradise is right there but it you know a lot of ways cabin fever is a survival at sea story and as Mike said earlier, a lot of us were kind of took this journey. And so kind of the whole point of us writing this book was to use a cruise ship to, to illustrate just kind of the intense uh, stress and anxiety we all went through. Well, I can't imagine the mental health situations that they're currently going through even today, because, I mean, to be out there trapped, I mean, and you know, especially, you know, we as human beings, we, we enjoy our freedoms, but they did not. Yeah, um, that's a very good point. They are, a lot of people basically have PTSD to this day. Mm, mm. One of the characters we profile in the book, uh, she's from Argentina, and she was probably as a passenger stuck on that boat longer than anybody because her country would not let people fly in, even if they were Argentines. So um, she was stuck on the ship for, you know, for weeks and weeks and weeks after the cruise ended. And, uh, you know, she got to the point where she couldn't even look at the ocean anymore when she got home and she happened to right. live on the ocean. <laughs> Um, and to this day, she still has uh, psychological issues that she's dealing with uh, because of that sort of desperate sense of never being able to get off that ship ever. Did they did they fear the future in the way that and I, I'm only bringing this up because it's the big headlines today is that when the president of the United States says we're getting ready for the second pandemic, here we go again. But what, what are we going to do to prepare the ships so they, they're not running out to sea and getting stuck out there again? Well, the whole the whole future of the cruise industry really is um, up in the air in all sorts of ways, because we've seen uh, amazingly you know, strict protocols on ships and then people still getting stuck. And you could definitely face a similar situation where a very infected ship all of a sudden um, is looked at by the world as some sort of infectious bug, you know. I, I do think that there's going to be a real wholesale rethinking of cruising and there's millions of loyal people who are still going to cruise and there's millions of people considering it and there's millions who'll never do it. But it's going to be a real challenge for, for both travelers and for industry to figure out wh- where's, the, where's the common sense line. And, um, you know, cruise ship is kind of like a prison. There's a lot of, <laughs> there's a lot of vectors. <laughs> so, so, um, have you guys been on a cruise ship since the pandemic? And the reason why I bring that up is because I'm at a movie premiere and I can see what what, what the uh, uh, pandemic has done to movie theaters. It's it's changed everything on ground. What has it done on, on the cruise ship? Have you seen anything like that? Well, it's funny you should ask that. I've never been on a cruise ship in my life, but uh, I have an eight-year-old daughter who's sitting here watching us. Um, and we're going to take her on a cruise ship in August on a Disney cruise um, <laughs> for the first time. Because I developed, I, it was never really my kind of thing, you know, the way to travel. And But I sort of developed a fascination. And and, and so I was writing this book. I was like, we, we really, really wished we, we could be on the Zandam. Uh, but unfortunately, it wasn't, it hasn't gone back to sea. So uh, I just decided, uh, you know, it's something I want to try. I want to do. I, I put my life into the, that world um, sort of virtually uh, for such a long time that um, I'm just going to go for it. But I am aware of the risks. And, um, you know, I think, you know, th- they have changed a lot of things to make cruises safer, starting with people have to be actually vaccinated against COVID. Um, um, you know, there's t- testing protocols when they need them. Um, but uh, like Jonathan said, cruise ships are the perfect st- Storm, so to speak, for any kind of clinical disease. Uh, you, you know, once it gets once it gets on board, it's really, really hard to stop. Uh, you know, just because of the nature of ships being cramped quarters everywhere. So, 
it's a risk, but uh, like Jonathan said, it is a huge market and, and there's just this incredible human fascination with ships and, and especially being in these luxurious environments on the seas that, uh, you know, people are just going to keep doing it until they can't anymore. I'm a writer. I know how emotional we get when, when it comes to writing and how much we get into the story. I have to ask you to with all this research and with all these connections with people who actually went through it. How are you doing mentally? For me, it was very interesting that you asked that question because uh, my daughter was working in an ICU unit for COVID uh, the, whole, the whole time during the, uh, the pandemic. So in certain ways, for me, this book was an ode to my daughter because she, she graduated from college and like literally the next day uh, went into an ICU unit. So I think that the it's always good to have a mission. Like when you're, if when people are in stressful situations or extreme survival situations, the people who do the best are the doctors, the nurses, somebody who has to care for other people. So in a certain way, this was very cathartic for us because we were able to show survival and we're trying to promote some of the, some of the best characteristics that, that, that flourished during a pandemic. So I think that there, there's a lot of positive messages that can come out with dealing with survival. So I think in certain way for us to have allowed people to show us in what ways may, maybe they become better people and what ways they've transformed after this. One of the mysteries of, you know, pandemia, apart from the fact that it's been a century since, you know, the world's gone through this, is, you know, how we will come out mentally. And, and cabin fever is not the answer by any stretch of the imagination, but cabin fever does allow you to get inside the heads and kind of look for collective solutions. So I, I personally feel grateful that it you know, even if I hadn't gotten paid a penny, writing the book itself was a, a very positive process. Well, to me, to me, vicariously, we're going to live through those people because we all have our own separate stories and things like that. But but through the two of you, I mean, there, there's such a connection here because, I mean, it's what life was going on, you know, what was taking place beyond us. And so and it's mentally I think it's going to help even readers. Yeah, I really hope so. I mean, I, um, like Jonathan said, I, I really developed a, a really close bond to some of the folks that we we talked to and were in our book. And I, I really feel like uh, I, I really came to get sort of emotionally, uh, I had just had a lot of empathy for what they were going through and just the the, the raw honesty that they, they, they described all that and opened up their lives to me and this horror, you know, these traumas that they went through. And there's some really, really sad stories uh, as well. But um, one thing that really made me uh, feel better about it was, um, you know, almost every single person that survived that journey um, really sort of found a, a sort of a new lease on life, sort of redemption in a lot of ways, and, uh, and, and, and decided that it's time to make a change. It's time to really just, just, just focus on what's important and, and because life is too short. And I found wow. that you guys refreshing. <laughs> Wow. You guys have got to come back to this show anytime in the future. The door is always going to be open for you. I love the way you guys write. I love the way you guys share the journey. And I know there's going to be many more stories with the two of you in the future. Thank you very much. Thanks for your interest. Thank you. Excellent. Will you guys be brilliant today? Okay. All right. You too. 